It's refreshment time, folks. To return some videotapes. Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Do you like scary movies, Sydney? You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. I don't need a TV. Books, records, films, these things matter. Call me Shallow. It's the fucking truth. Over 1,600 titles, each for rent at just $2 the first night and only a... I don't watch TV. Yeah, but you are aware that there's an invention called television, and on this invention they show shows, right? Tonight on Six Ed World. Okay, I want channels 18, 24, 63, 187, and weather channel. Welcome to the Frog Brothers Podcast with your hosts, Justin and Alec. Hello, and welcome to episode 48 of the Frog Brothers Podcast. I'm Justin. And I'm Alec. And uh, we've got Nick on the phone tonight because uh, it's fucking obnoxiously cold here. Nick, how you doing, buddy? Hi, I'm Nick, and I'm live. Sort of. But I'm also, I'm also very cold. You are cold, you goddamn hippie. You cold-hearted bastard. Where, where, where are you at right now? Colombia. Oh, you're in Colombia? Getting some fresh cocaine. It's going to throw a matcha powder, huh? It's my well, terrible scar down face. Here, you know, the highway, the highway is fine. I get to Columbia, and Columbia is like worse than anywhere, you know, any, you know, Kansas City or anything. Right. That's because they don't like Columbia yeah. in the state of Missouri. Yeah. So I was like, I was expecting it to be manageable, but yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, we cover can't can't see the roads i i got on the exit and i couldn't see like where the road actually is and my tire went kind of off and i had like a little bit of a dip i struggled to get back up on it so. poor little fella well I'm we're glad it. you're okay get and down on it get back up on it so everyone's experiencing throughout most of the country this obnoxious cold crap and uh we finally have heat back here in my place i didn't know if uh we were going to yeah uh, heat pump doesn't keep up, and the uh, emergency strips were out, so luckily we got those fixed today. So we're uh, about 12 degrees warmer now than we were... I feel like this is what it's like to podcast in Canada, eh? Canadians, eh? You can take your cold weather and shove it up your boot. Take off, hoser. How yeah. cold did it get in your apartment? In my duplex, it got to duplex. 55 degrees inside was the lowest I saw it. Oh, that's... That's a cold house. Yeah. That's not horrible, I guess. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was it, it wasn't it won't fun. Kill you. Yeah. No. It won't kill you, but it sure as shit didn't feel good. I'll tell you that. Did you did you guys get any uh short term power outage? We have not had any of the rolling power outages, so hopefully we don't experience one while we're doing this. Is yeah. that is that metro wide or just like in the actual city? That's in a 13-state metropolitan area across uh, an energy, basically, I don't think it's an actual cooperative, uh, but states. yeah, 13 yeah. states are part of this collective that helps, you know, has power all in the same power grid, so goddamn yeah. Texans are hogging power because they're not used to cold weather, <laughs> even though the amount of AC they use in the summer, you yeah. think they'd be able to fucking handle it, but guess not. Yeah, they're losing their shit in yeah, Texas. Texas is getting some snow, yeah. Serves them right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know any people in Texas, but uh, if you're listening to this from Texas... They're just steers and, and homosexuals. You can say queers. That's the line from the movie, Nick. It's okay to <laughs> quote a movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. I bet you could suck a golf ball through a garden hose. I've actually seen do, Nick do that once before in person. The other mm -hmm. time I saw it was a video that I recorded while I did it. Hmm. I've oh. seen the video. Well, who hasn't? It's up on uh, OnlyFans.com slash Nick's Garden Hose. I don't feel like a golf ball would be that difficult to a garden hose. Really? Well, you made it look pretty easy, so I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Looks real nice, Clark. Oh, man. Real nice. Son, your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. So uh... yeah, I can still hear all those things. I, he I heard the music, and I heard your sound clip there. All right, that's oh, good. Awesome. Justin said he couldn't hear it earlier, so it's good that you can. 
<laughs> Justin's just an old deaf bastard, I guess. No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Let the hate flow through you. You suck that guy's dick? <laughs> I just love throwing that in there. It's, uh, it makes me laugh. So Alec has uh, an obsession with the soundboard now that he's got it in front of his fingertips. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> so uh, what our are lives we... are in your hands, and all you have is butterfingers. Yeah, I should get that on there. Uh, so the news this week. So NECA today dick teased us all with a picture of mm. future Doc Brown with a case of money from all eras, mm -hmm. which was pretty badass. Yeah, um, it definitely... Got his little visor or thing on, too. Yeah. Which now I'm... that I, I have all these figures now, I don't know if both of you guys do as well, have the whole set. Um, I'm really looking I still looking haven't for... picked up Doc, even though every time I see it in a Target, I'm, like, you know, in a hurry working. Yeah. So I haven't, so I haven't grabbed it yet myself. But... Well, you need to get your 1955 Doc Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the, the future of this line, so... I yeah, think it'd I be pretty awesome. Yeah. I, was I was a little concerned that they weren't selling well enough. But I think they are. Maybe I mean, this just happens to be one thing them. that Target's actually, and even Walmart seems to have in stock, and they can still continue the line and just not produce as many. Right? Yeah. NECA, NECA does that sometimes. So Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's been an easy line to find. Yeah, it's been low stress, for, which has been nice. At least. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Walmart even had its own section with just Back to the Future stuff. Yeah, and they still have the some other things section. there that yeah, Target never had, but if you're lucky, you can go out there and find some clearance items in some Walmart still, I think, maybe. Most of those probably got wiped out unless you're in a small town where people don't collect shit. Now, I haven't watched it yet, but there is a Gremlins Mountain Dew commercial. Mountain Dew Zero, I think, is what it is. Yep. I watched one of them. Apparently, there's a bunch of different spots. Howie Mandel actually reprised his voice of Gizmo, which is pretty badass. Yeah, um, the only thing it just pisses me off when shit like this happens, and it's not like they're, it's not like a, make the fucking movie. I don't give a shit about a goddamn commercial. Bring me another fucking movie with Zach Gall Galligan. Yeah, I think that's it. They probably will. They fucking better. Well, if the uh, cartoon series does well, I can't imagine they wouldn't do something. Maybe a TV series would be pretty fun too. Yeah, well, the limited series is gonna be fun, and then we'll see what happens from there. I mean, because if you saw any of the behind-the-scenes stuff for this, like they, you know, did awesome puppetry and everything else, like very old-school style the way they did it, so clearly it's easy to do, so. Yeah. 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 Mayor. Honk. Uh, so. Not guess... much else going on in the news, really, besides this terrible cold and toys and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what? Joss Whedon's trying to get canceled again just because he's, uh, you know, everyone's got allegations against him, so I guess we'll see how that plays out. But he's always seems to have some allegations coming out against him, and no one's been able to hold him accountable yet. So I guess we'll see what happens there. Yeah, we'll see. Are what we gonna happens. are we gonna have a moment of silence for Gina Carano's career? Moment no. of silence. Uh... I ban thee from the Star Wars universe, right wing nut job. You yeah. heard? You heard God. It's funny hearing all the fucking crazy that? Republicans like asking for, and I, John, not even just Republicans, but people like you can't just cancel people. It's not cancel culture; it's accountability culture. Right, right. You're canceling well, shit and, for and people they're, that. And they're also. Well, like but they're also guilty of trying to cancel people, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I get it, right? But I mean, she said shit, and she had her chance to say it more. And now she was just fucking pushing her luck. Like I feel like she's trying to fucking become a martyr by doing that on purpose. Is the way I feel with her because like she got in trouble yeah, she's for it before. Talking and like a martyr. Yeah, yeah and yeah. You, and you see, um, I like I like to as Ben Shapiro here. I like to I like to just explain it for a moment. You see that uh, Gino, uh, she she's gonna do a movie with me, and uh, you know we're both oh, yeah, weaselly assholes. <laughs> so uh, you know uh, somebody should uh, you know ban us from uh, existence. And uh, no one told me until today that her name was Gina. I I, I thought her name was Gina. I kept calling her Gina. <laughs> Wet ass p word. Fucking hate that guy. I fucking hate that guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does he know that she posed topless on her Instagram? Does he, is he aware of that? If he doesn't like the uh, WAP, she did. 
Yeah, one point she got in trouble for it, and she made a big stink out about that, too. Like, she's just out there trying to get attention now. It's like, yeah, I'm sure your MMA career sucked, okay? I, I feel so bad for you. Here's an idea to do what no, other people do. Get a real job. Also, don't be an asshole. I'm sorry. I don't want to see her topless. No, I'm good. That'd be like seeing uh, 90s Roseanne topless. I'm all right. No, thanks. <laughs> I'm good. That might be a little better than that. I don't think so. I'm good. I'm solid. No, thanks. Yeah, I don't know about that, man. If you want to see Roseanne Arnold topless, just look up Gina Carino's uh, former photos online. <laughs> As Dave Chappelle would say about Gina, she wears on a pants with dick holes in them. Gina, get it right. Gina. We're going to call her that. <laughs> uh, no, but, yeah, I just really don't like her, so makes me hey, extra wouldn't rude. Roseanne have been the martyr? Roseanne would have been the martyr first anyway. Well, well, Roseanne already Roseanne got canceled, so they're. Year, I don't even. I'm not even relating to that. I'm just saying she looks like Roseanne in the '90s to me. No, I mean they're acting like Gina to do this, but Roseanne got canceled for the same thing. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, she had her chance. All she had to do was not be an asshole anymore on social media, and yet technically, she technically the same company, right? Because ABC is Disney, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, all she had to do was not say asinine stuff and, like, comparing yourself to being persecuted like Jews in the Holocaust. I'm sorry, no. This is going to be hilarious. I'm going to go back and look at our metrics and see that as soon as we started talking about <laughs> Gina, that everybody dropped off and was like, man, fuck these guys. Man, they don't know what they're talking about, man. They're, a, they're fucking idiots, man. Uh, like, Gina's just a, it's a violation of freedom of speech, man. No. Anyone that listens <laughs> to us clearly knows that we're fucking assholes and we speak freely. <laughs> and guess what? We're not comparing <laughs> ourselves to being in Holocaust concentration camp simply because we're not fucking ignorant. <sighs> Imagine I'm surprised. being such a bigot that you that you gave up your job with Disney just to tweet something asshole. I guess you if know? you if if you want me to say something positive about Gina, I would say that Gina <laughs> isn't <This> is like <laughs> fucking getting like I almost feel bad like we're gonna get some shit now that this is derogatory towards women. <laughs> No, her name's Gina Carano. That's because that's what Ben Shapiro would call her. Yeah, um, uh, that is what I would call it, you see, because, you know, that's how her name would be pronounced, you see, if you if you look into it and, and then you actually analyze it. The only thing that could make Gina Carano worse is if she was a Holocaust denier. So at least she acknowledges that the Holocaust happened. I mean, she's not a flat earther yet, and she's mm -hmm. not a Holocaust denier, so I guess she's got that going for her, which is not yeah, really going to keep her company. It happened, though, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's a whole other thing. We don't have time to get into that tonight. <laughs> Let's move on to some greener pastures. Um, perhaps... Imagine if I had nipples this long as my fingers. Well, then you'd look like the Ben Affleck bat suit. Just kidding. If they were like little dicks, basically, they'd get hard. You know, like that little, look at my finger. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, yeah, those little guys. Nick, you can't see this. You'll have to watch it later, but it's pretty fun. Yeah. So WandaVision, episode six, man. This stuff's getting really intense. Oh, yeah, it's getting, it's getting interesting. The last episode ended with a teaser of the return of Quicksilver. Yeah, that was last week. That was good. I know. And then, like, this week, we got a full episode of Quicksilver, which is badass. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot to take away from this episode. Like, the whole thing with Vision walking around is kind of like, all right, we get it, we get it, get to the shit. And then he gets to Agnes. And that scene is just fascinating because he, like, awakes her, just like he did the guy in the last episode. And she's, like, saying some weird shit like, hey, you're dead, and you're an Avenger. And he's like, I don't know what any of that means. Who the fuck are you? Yeah, like being like his death wiped his memory. So, yeah, and it's still confusing as to what state he's living in. But whatever state he's living in, it seems that this Quicksilver is also perhaps living in right now because they flash to him at some point being dead. But it's interesting because it's this version shot in the same place as the other version of Quicksilver was shot. Yes, it was very. Very intentional the way they did all that. Yes, because. We, they still have us, we have no idea what's going to happen here still. And they start out, you know, you think this episode's going to be really whimsical and fun, and 
you know, you see like the old school Avenger costumes for the Halloween costumes. I like how they had Quicksilver and uh, one of the twins. Yeah, you know, those are definitely. That was pretty cool seeing all that on there. I that, like how they made it all. Like the intro was done. Um, the singer of Bikini Kill was the singer for that. Oh, okay. That's cool. So that's fascinating. I saw an article about that. Writing and recording that process. Yeah, yeah so that's cool. Um, that intro was very Malcolm in the Middle-ish is what I've read on the internet yeah, because I, I didn't watch that one. show much. So, Yeah, I think this whole the whole episode was based on Malcolm in the Middle's format for yeah. talking yeah. to the camera and all that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's fascinating. Um, and then the thing I really liked is when Vision decided to go out past the, uh, what was that street called that they didn't want to go past? She told the kids never to go past a certain street, and that's where you see Agnes oh, okay. basically when she's like turning around over there. Yeah, it's, and then, that's very specific. Yeah, it's the corner. And then later he walks off. Yeah. And fucking exits, and it tears his ass apart, uh, literally, until uh, one of the Wanda's kid reveals she uh, he has like the one of the psychic powers, kind of like whatever. So like he can tell that Vision's in trouble. So yeah, he, he can tells hear, her he can hear his pain or whatever, so he knows. Where, so she where like he's fucking at. expands the boundaries of the town by like, and just fucking. Like, I don't know how, like, doubles, triples, quadruples, I don't know what she fucking does, but it, it goes on for a while, and they're, like, running from it to avoid getting sucked into it, but then they had already handcuffed Darcy because they had been kicked out in the last episode, so uh, Darcy was sucked into the fucking universe, so we'll see where that goes, too. That'll be interesting. I did like the conversion of everything changing, like you see oh, yeah. everyone become part of a clown or a circus or whatever there on the edge of town, because all the tents they had set up for the base. Yeah, it's... Yeah, a sword turned into a circus, yeah. So then this, I guess this just opens more questions up, is like, does this mean that we're not sure who's actually in control? Because obviously one is still extremely powerful, as she can expand the borders of this town, and um, this dome or whatever she's got up, but it still seems like there's someone behind the scenes, you know, kind of manipulating her to some degree. Mm-hmm. Because, like, she's clearly still grieving everything, right? This is the biggest disaster in a dome since Katrina. Hey, zing, zinger, edge lord, catch me on the edge, cause I'm lord of the edges. <laughs> He's a lord of edging on his OnlyFans. Oh uh, yeah, that too. But usually, I get into the ruined orgasm territory, where you, you just like stretch the muscle out for too long, and then it goes limp anyway, and you're like, what the fuck here? You go too long, <laughs> and then you can't finish the job, huh? You know what I mean? You're stretching out too long. It's like, I'm, I'm giving her all I've got, Captain. This thing looks like a... My dick looks like Alf's face. Looks like a car in the ditch on the side of the road in a snowstorm because you can't finish. <laughs> <laughs> just all beat up and jagged around the edges, turned over. No one wants yeah. to see it. Everyone just ignores that it's there. My dick looks like Kurt Russell in Escape from New York. Oh, I, ho- I was hoping you were going to say the thing because that's uh, more accurate to the weather right now. <laughs> oh, that's true. I mean, it would if I went outside and got naked. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone would see. You could probably get away, like, walking around naked right now. My turtle would go into its shell, man. I, <laughs> I think he that. might turn inside out. <laughs> oh. Captain Ron out there. oh, that's true. I would have much prefer that. Yes. So, man, uh, this episode of WandaVision was great. I'm just excited to see what's going to happen next. We're For close. Sure. Close to the end, and I suppose these next couple episodes are an hour long, is what they're saying. Oh, I haven't heard that, but the they uh, the one before this one was forty minutes, and some of them are only like twenty three or twenty five. So yeah, they are varying. Yeah, which is kind of longer every time, every week, hasn't it? A little bit, yeah. I mean, maybe I haven't paid that close of attention, but I think the first four were probably twenty three minutes, maybe. But I mean, this one's double the other ones, and it didn't feel that much longer either. Because once you have the pacing going, it really just the the tempo really moves it through. So yeah, definitely excited to see where that goes. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, what else you got on uh, One Division, Nick? What was your favorite moment in this show? I'd say the oh shit, what's her name again? Their friend Agnes out on the road. Yeah, Agnes. I thought that was the most interesting. People think that she's. Maybe the villain, or somehow behind it, or knows more than what she seems to know. So I'm kind of curious what this new episode means for that. Yeah, I, c- I could definitely see that being what a big she's piece. Going out there and 
Was she trying to leave town? Did she know what she was doing? I don't know. She seemed to be like caught up in a loop there or something, you know, so that was interesting. Some people have theorized also that the guy in charge of S.W.O.R.D. now, um, Hayward, is that his name? Yeah. He, it might be a scroll. some people are saying. Yeah, I heard that too. Oh, okay, that would make sense. That's just fascinating. But also, um, what about uh, everybody seems like, what were they, moving really slowly when Vision was out walking? Yeah, like she can't, her powers only go so far, so when people get far away from her, I think is what that is. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Like, he gets further away from her, and, they, and she has over the people. Or... Yeah, but the way she expanded the dome around the town, I think it's whatever in the— I think that dome amplifies her powers over the entire city. So, and I'm not sure if that was her rage or a combination, like if we'll find out what's going on with that. But um, pretty interesting concept that, you know, we haven't seen anything like this think? in the MCU yet, so it's fun. What do you think was happening with Vision when he left, when he was trying to leave? I mean, I think he was just of the field. I think he was just decomposing back to his state yeah. that she stole him from. He was barely, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like That's only, what I was thinking. He only exists inside of it, so if he tries to leave, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was my take. Yeah, because like his body started to decompose and like looked like the state that she, you know, when they showed us the clip of her stealing his corpse back out of the from the Sentinel program. Keep in mind the word. Well, Sentinel. they tried to say, she, like, they tried to say like she resurrected him, but. Uh, uh, I, I think she just has control over not his... Not for sure. I think she just, yeah, his I think body. she's just able to manipulate the body in the, in her dome, Ooh. so... So she's a little necrophiliac there. Well, I mean, she's clearly grieving, but that's a whole other level there. Yeah, yeah well... It's interesting. We'll, we'll just have to see where it's, it's all gonna, gonna go, go still. I like how, uh, Quicksilver's still fairly funny in this, um... It was as funny as, yeah. you know, some Marvel characters can be, but uh, like his character was in the X-Men films is all I'm referring Yeah, to. His, his personality, like, has carried over from that one, yeah. and I think that was a good choice. But I think, you know, you're also seeing this be part of the mutant stuff, right? I think we're really starting to see the setup of the X-Men being integrated in here, right? And it's going to be a slow burner. We might start to see a lot more of this go on or something, but obviously with... Do you think maybe all of the mutants' origins are going to start here i don't know if they're going to start here but i mean i think that's a good theory that you could do that but there's things that are just setting this up obviously you have quicksilver from the x-men universe and you have the sentinel program in there which was like a throwaway line in that episode unless you're listening closely um so i think we're going to see something going on here you also can't like have magneto be from a you know from the holocaust or anything too right because he'd be really old at this point yeah i mean they're, they're probably they going to update some, some of the well here's the thing about that yeah. he could be all you have to do is take him from any different time period because uh this version of quicksilver right here he's this yeah. age in the 90s or you just age slower but i'm saying he would age he'd be 20 years older than he is now minimum 30 years really He'd be like a 60-year-old oh, yeah, Quicksilver because this Quicksilver was a teenager yeah, in the true, 70s. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that you could. there's still some manipulation and shit you could do. So Yeah, I think there's a lot of options with it. I don't, and I don't think we're going to see anything finalized at the end of this series. I think we're going to get a good ending, but I think it's just going to set us up to additional... We'll get some growth. answers to questions, maybe like what the fuck is happening with Vision and Quicksilver, but then there'll be additional questions introduced. <laughs> Yeah, like, I honestly don't think we're going to hear anything else about Sentinels in this series right now. I think that was, like, the one line just kind of throwing that away and saying, you know, they're going to take that technology from Vision's corpse and still use that because, obviously, they're still able to work on him. And with Tony Stark being dead, there's no one there to stop them from taking Vision's corpse and, like, utilizing him with sword. Yeah. So. Well, is that all we've got on WandaVision this week? I think that wraps us up. What are we? 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 Uh, what are we uh, talking about next? Well, let's talk about some love stories. All righty then. I suppose. You know what I just watched? Me pulling a can off some moron's fist. Return of the Jedi. Did you see Alien? When that uh, creature was in that guy's stomach? <sighs> Oh my god! You ever seen that really old movie? Empire Strikes Back? Jesus, Tony. Welcome to Retro Release Reviews. 
Welcome to Retro Release Reviews. So it was Valentine's Day yesterday, and now hindsight's always twenty twenty. so, you know, our dumbasses should have done this episode last week, but here you are. We're celebrating a day late. You get, you get we're, short. We're like your coupon day for your Halloween, or uh, not your we'll Halloween do a candy. Coupon day or something. Yeah, we'll do a coupon day. All candy is 50% off. We observe off Valentine's Day on Monday. <laughs> yeah. So, we uh, did some celebrating by watching some romantic films together in our underwear. Wait, no, that was just me in my room by myself. Oh. Yeah. Well, I watched them fully nude. Um, with several different devices um, plugged into my asshole. Well, I hope you weren't on my fucking couch when you did that, you goddamn heathen. I did, but I flipped the couch cushions so you won't notice. <laughs> Nick, next time you come over, I need you to bring a black light device. <laughs> you, and, you don't want to blind yourself, do you? <laughs> and, yeah, well, and, that could have been. And an that, upholstery cleaner. That could have been from you before, Alec, though. So. No, <laughs> I got a little more couth than that. Oops. So, we're going to talk about True Romance, one of the fucking greatest movies about love. But it's also very action-packed, but it's amazing dialogue, and if you're not familiar or you don't remember, well, your boy Quentin Tarantino wrote this flick. However, he did not direct it. No, that was directed by Tony Scott, not to be confused with Ridley. But he is his brother. True. True. But not anymore, because he committed suicide off the Golden Gate Bridge, which you may have heard about a few years ago. Wow. Rip. Which is fucked up and dark. So He also you... directed Top Gun. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but if you are experiencing mental illness or feeling alone and sorrow in the world, get help. People really do care. That's crazy. That just shows you like that stuff affects everyone, no matter your status, no matter your wealth, no matter your class. Everyone has that shit going on. So... In a serious note, which we don't get serious here too much, but if you need help, just reach out for it. There's plenty of people that care. Just Come talk on, to somebody. kill me, I'm here! <laughs> God damn it, I, I say something nice and like sincere and Alex over here like fucking getting ready to jump Son off the couch. Of a bitch. How to lighten the mood, you know? Facebook. Yeah. Facebook has a support link, too. I know, Nick got called out on that today for a three-year-old <laughs> post about um, autoerotic asphyxiation. Hey, which it goes back to uh, Tarantino, because that's how David was, Carradine died. It was a Simpsons joke, too. It was like on The Simpsons, and pretty much. I mean, they added a little to it. But. I mean, yeah, they just put some verbiage around the picture of actual yeah. show. Yeah. I uh, I actually got reported on Instagram a while ago when I made some like suicide jokes on there, like three or four years ago at this point. And it had suggested like some suicide hotlines and stuff like that. So it's good to know that that stuff exists out there. Um, some people now, just maybe. some people just deal with the darkness by making way inappropriate jokes, and sometimes that's us. Sometimes that's other people. Yeah, but that's where we're at with it. There's no such thing as an appropriate joke. That's why it's a joke. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the second time you played that tonight. Yeah, I'll play it anytime it's appropriate. Yeah. All right, so we're talking true romance. So if you wonder why some of the scenes in this movie feel like Top Gun. Well, Tony Scott directed it. Mm -hmm. Specifically the scene where Alabama makes love to the birthday boy. It's all like silhouette, dark scenes, romantic music, and you're like, hey, I've seen this before. And then you're like, hey, that's in Top Gun. And you're like, hey, that's the same director. Hey, I bet that's the type of porn he watches. And then you go down a weird rabbit hole and you wonder what he really was into. And before you know it, you're spending the night finding out uh, who the director of the Top Gun porn, porn parody, parody was <laughs> and going down his rabbit hole of filmography and seeing that he also directed a movie called Rabbit Hole and then having to watch said movie. While dressed as a rabbit from yes. Donnie Darko. Do it. All right, so Clarence in Alabama. Love. It's a beautiful love oh, story. Um, so This I was a movie. Let me give you some backstory here. Yes, backstory. Uh, Tarantino wrote this. This was one of the Tarantino. first things he wrote. Um, first thing he wrote. Basically, he this was combined with Natural Born Killers at one point. They were one combined. movie. Uh, which is funny because they both ended up being separated and in, made into their own 
respective movies made by different directors, which this one is way more faithful through the actual screenplay and is a better movie in general. Siamese movie twins. Uh, Natural Born Killers is okay, but that's not what we're talking about today because it's not as good as a movie as true fucking romance. Christian Slater. Uh, this and Heather's are my favorite roles of his. This is pretty good. I mean, he's on point throughout this whole fucking movie. He's like mm-hmm. firing on all cylinders like you believe his character. So He pulls off Tarantino's dialogue well, and you can tell it's Tarantino dialogue. The way he even says it, it almost feels like Tarantino directed it because Tony Scott did such a good job with the screenplay. Yeah, he actually he understood the screenplay, which I think really works for that. Yeah, I mean, there's some things that they change, like they reorganize the script into back being in order, like uh, chronologically instead of something more like Pulp Fiction. And he changed the ending shootout scene with, you know, character deaths and stuff. But supposedly he talked Tarantino into being cool with it, so I don't know. I don't know, the fun thing about this, like, as a pop culture podcast, like, you see how much of a fan uh, Clarence is of all this stuff, and then, like, when he meets Alabama, she's into a lot of the stuff, too, and, like, I think she winds up lying and saying the only thing that she didn't really like after there, she confesses, like, that was a big moment for her was to confess that, like, she was, it was a setup and she felt guilty about it, um, was that she didn't like the Partridge family. Yeah. And so I thought that was pretty cool. You're like, okay, and that was kind of subdued, right? It didn't really go into that very much, but they could have gone way off the deep end with that in the movie had they wanted to, and it still would have worked a lot. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, They talked about the Sonny Chiba movies, the the Street Fighter movies. Um, I've actually wanted to check those out at some point because they're recommended by just Kung Fu nuts in general. So I might end up getting a review for you guys of those at some point, even if it's on YouTube, but... There's just stuff like that, and then the whole fact of, uh, you know, Val Kilmer being Elvis throughout this movie and kind of whispering in Clarence's ear and saying weird shit and manipulating him almost, yeah. And doesn't he just have the two appearances, one near the beginning and, like, kind of one near the final act there in the bathroom scene? Those are the big two. Was there there another another? one? I only wrote wrote down the notes of the two times we saw him. I couldn't remember, to be honest, but... And it was very cool. There might have been a third, but... And you don't see his face at all, right? And I guess that was very intentional when they did editing on this. They said, you know, you know, we're not going to show his face. And it works that way. And Val Kilmer, per Alec, telling me this, said, you know, they're worried he's going to be pissed about not showing his face. And he's like, no, I think that's kind of cool. It's subdued that way. And you don't worry about... You're way less interested in him being an Elvis impersonator when you don't see the face of the person who's doing it. Yeah. Um, it plays off much better. The cast in this movie is fucking ridiculous. Um, I was going to say, there's a lot of big, great actors that are in it for a short time. Yeah. Uh, that's a, like, that surprised me quite a bit. A, yeah, let's just start with it. You know, we talked about Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, obviously. There's an Arquette in both of these movies we're talking about today, but uh, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. But Patricia Arquette in this movie is stunning and excellent. Yeah, she's great in this. I mean, she's... She plays the role, and, like, you truly believe that she's that character the whole time, right? She just has this authenticness to her portrayal of that character of Alabama. Yeah. Um, then you also have uh, my favorite, Dennis Hopper. He uh, is fucking excellent in this, and he has a scene with Christopher Walken. And that's fucking amazing. Like, that whole thing, that whole exchange is fucking perfect. There's nothing I would change about the way that was shot and performed. Yeah, it's it's pretty insane. Um it goes without saying, Gary Oldman and Brad Pitt are some of the most iconic roles from this movie that people mention the most. Brad Pitt is like so... Brad Pitt mostly because he's just completely opposite of what you're used to. Like, this is one of his earlier roles, so he's just basically the stoner on the couch. And I do like how he's smoking out of a Gatorade bong that he's made, which yeah. is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I love that shit. Uh, his his role as Floyd is just hilarious. He's Michael Rapaport's, uh roommate there. And uh, James Gandolfini is one of the gangsters. Um, but but Gary Oldman... Uh, is Drexel is fucking on point. Yeah. And you can't forget Sam Jackson in there, too, right? All these millennials talking about eating ass and pussy and stuff. Like, this is the OG speech about it in a movie, and it's all thanks to Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, and it's hilarious, because you're sitting there disagreeing so hard with these characters. Oh, yeah. They're rude. Just yeah. don't know how to do it. 
That's how you that's that's how you move from being a mere mortal to a god. It's not the only time Tarantino's mentioned pussy eating in movies. No. Um, and it would later be brought up in pulp, pulp, uh, pulp Fiction. So, And his whole obsession with it in uh, From Dust Till Dawn, as himself, nonetheless. So let's yeah. not forget that. Apple pie, pussy! Did you mean it, what you said back there? <laughs> uh, gotta love Tarantino. Now listen here. Uh, oh, and then the old cock shot to Drexel. That was amazing when they fucking murder him. Mm-hmm. Another uh, Tarantino classic. Uh... Sam Jackson gets that in Hateful Eight. Um, there's more than just that. There's one in almost every one of his fucking movies, I feel like. Seems to be a reoccurring theme. Like, some of them, like, they're more noticeable than others. Like, this one's, like, very... They, like, they show, like, them Drexel, like, in his silk underwear getting shot in the cock, and you're like, whoa. You're not fucking around right there. Yeah, it's one of those things when you see it, you, like, get, like, that gut-sick feeling in your stomach. Because you imagine your testicles and or cock and balls in general just blown apart. And the whole scene between Drexel and Clarence fighting, like when he's in the, the pimp house or whatever, Drexel's lair, whatever you want to call it. He must have thought it was white boy day. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, it's got fucking Mortal Kombat vibes, pre-Mortal Kombat. So, like, I imagine if you're, like, a, game, if you're a game designer, yeah, you, fic- you see this movie and you're like, <laughs> fuck. Because they got, like, early 90s, like, techno music going on there and you're like okay and they've yeah. got that whole scene going on throughout the fight which works really well and then you're like god damn that's perfect so I love how you see the influence of pop culture in video games and like how they influence each other back and forth regularly and this is a great early sign of that in the early 90s yeah it's um also if I was going to mention Tom Sizemore and Chris Penn as the cops uh mm-hmm. They're fascinating, and this is one of the bits that this dialogue in their portrayal and the music that's played when they're on screen and stuff and some of the traumatic music that's played in the ending shootout, you can tell it's not something that if Tarantino directed that music would be totally different, and you'd get a different vibe from this ending shootout. It would feel more like Reservoir Dogs, and there might not even be any music happening, but there's such tragic music that this starts the ending starts to feel like natural born killers um it's just it just takes me out of it every time it's weird yeah i mean the cops do a great job in their right and it's interesting to see how that all plays out this is for cody but you also see that you know we're talking about influences elsewhere right so i think one of the other things i have is the taxi driver outfit um Tyler Durden looks like that in Fight Club, and that's very heavily influenced by the Elvis sunglasses that Clarence is wearing in this whole, in one of these scenes in here, and you're like, oh, shit, like, that really shows up later on, and it's funny that Brad Pitt's in that, and, you know, you just kind of see how these things go hand in hand from one way to another and, like, carry along those lines and, and influence each other in subtle ways or just, and even if they're so subtle, like, whether that's the costume design or somebody else noticing these things and putting that in place, like, that's still pretty awesome. And if you're a huge Tarantino fan, you know that he doesn't do a lot of commentaries if you're a commentary listener. But he did do a commentary for this, uh, and if you are into those, I highly recommend listening to that. It's fascinating just to hear his take on it. And there is a disturbing... I would have thought he would have done more. You know, for all the violence and everything else in this movie, you know what the most disturbing thing in this movie for me was? Is when Alabama kisses Clifford on the on the mouth Tom Brady style oh. Tom Brady style and then he's like <laughs> says something about her tasting like a peach and you're like mm-hmm. threw up in my mouth a little bit that was kind of gross but I was like yeah that's something Tom Brady would do or Tom Brady's dad would kiss Giselle in the mouth like open tongue kisser yeah but I'm pretty sure that was her in that movie in the movie of like instigating it or whatever oh yeah yeah you never know but it's, it's, still. it's still it's still weird as fuck like why is this happening why am I looking at this Pretty much. And then uh, you get to the whole Clifford scene, like hanging out in this trailer when you got start getting him interrogated by that, and then like, they cut his hand open, and like, what, do they pour alcohol on it or whatever? And like, he's flipping out about it, but he fucking holds true, and then starts talking shit right to his face about Italians. You're like, God damn, like, that's a motherfucker that does not care. But that's totally Tarantino when you watch that. You know, you get those whole vibes. 
Yeah, because it's, uh, you know, Dennis Hopper says the N-word about 100 times. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, because you can clearly tell that Dennis Hopper's character isn't necessarily even racist, but he knows he's going to die, and he wants to piss this motherfucker off, and he knows that he's the type of guy who is racist and that who would be offended by this, so he spews all that shit at him. Yeah, I was going to say, you can tell, like, when he's telling that to Christopher Walken's character, you really see that he can tell he's getting under his skin, so he just fucking pushes the button. So mm-hmm. if, like, if he's like, you're going to kill me, I'm going to make it worth the fucking trouble. I'm not going to go out like a fucking bitch in this chair. Yeah. And then they have the whole scene where, like, they get out to California and they're having the time of their life out there and, like, look like they're having fun, which is... I love uh, Michael Rappaport's audition. <laughs> Driving the fucking car. Oh, to yeah. To be on TJ Hooker. Yeah, that's a fun scene, like, in there just seeing him. <laughs> and he's great, man. Like, he's he's so good in that movie for, like, such a small character that's not, like, you know... Like, his character is very earnest and, like, honest, and you'd think... He could be at any point. They could have written him completely different and more of dark, but he's a really lighthearted character that just kind of brings up the shit. He's a very great balance, and like sometimes you don't always get that in, in a Tarantino movie. But I think like his portrayal in this worked really well. That he was lighthearted enough to make it not feel so serious, so you could just enjoy the moments where Clarence and Alabama were together having fun and just experiencing California, despite the other bullshit going on. Like on the road trip out to California, like they fucking a phone booth, right? And so, like, there's those romantic things where, like, it's a young couple in, in love, like, deeply in love, and they're just doing, like, wild shit because they don't care. You know, they're just living in the moment. Elliot has one of my uh, favorite lines from this movie, though, uh, which is uh, when he's talking on the phone with uh, his uh, boss, and he's like, you want me to suck his dick? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that is a good, yeah. It just, it, it, it sneaks by really quick, but it's fucking hilarious. Um, Elliot's character in general is interesting. He seems like out of um, he seems like he walked right out of the movie Bottle Rocket to me. One of the, my other favorite sequences in this film, and there's some great ones in here. I mean, don't get me wrong at all, but um, Alabama when she's talking to James Gandolfini's character, and I don't even know if they tell you his name, just since he's just basically a mobster thug, and. He's out there, and you know, like, and he starts to tell her how he's killed people. Like the first time he kills somebody, it's a little unsettling. The second time, you get used to it, and just kind of telling her, like, he has no problem killing. Jeez, you. There it goes. <laughs> I was wondering if he caught that. <laughs> oh yeah, he caught it. But I love how she has the corkscrew right, and she's holding it up to her, and he's kind of like laughing at her, and then he, you know, he's just kind of like fucking taunting her, and she stabs him in the foot with it, which is totally unexpected because you're like, is she gonna try to stab him in the belly with that? And she stabs his foot, which. Works out really well, and then he finds the suitcase under the bed at that point, and it's a really well-written scene, really well-performed, and I just love how that sequence works because, you know, like, he's beating the fuck out of her, and you're like, Jesus, like, what a ruthless piece of shit, yet she's fucking just taking it like a champ, like, she's not gonna, like, fucking let him win, so it it was a great, great scene in that film for me. She gets fucking primal in that scene. After oh. she blows him away, she's just, like, fucking shaking with a shotgun in her arms, covered in blood, and it's like, holy shit. Well, I mean, it feels like a horror movie to some degree, right? Because as she's dealing with this, like, fucking crazy killer, she takes the toilet tank lid, fucking decks him with that. Yeah. Then she uses the fucking hairspray and lighter for a fucking blowtorch, and then she fucking shoots him with a shotgun and just fucking, like, unloads it when she's fucking done with him, finally. And you're like, damn, did not fuck around at all. Damn! was perfect yeah it's uh no it's 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 impressive it's a good movie um you've probably watched it if you're listening to this i hope i don't know maybe not maybe if you're listening to this you're like oh i should go watch this movie the other thing in this that's interesting and like the last noteworthy piece for me anyway is the uh when the one guy after the big drug deal goes down and says you know like i need help i need help or call call me an ambulance and uh, he goes, I'll call you a hearse, and then fucking murders him in cold blood, like right in front of everybody. Yeah, and that's, says that that's for his partner or whatever. This is for Cody. Yeah, it's which like is the, fucking brutal, man. That's a fucking meme on its own, right? This is for Cody or whatever. And then I love how at the end they just walk out of the scene. You know, they just walk out of the hotel. Yeah. Like his face is covered in blood, and like somehow they manage to just walk out and, you know, and get by everybody, which obviously you're suspending disbelief for a movie, but 
fucking wild they shit. We're pretty distracted though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it, it is what it is. And then clearly they named their son Elvis, even though uh, Val Kilmer is credited as the role of mentor, not Elvis impersonator, or Elvis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we all know he what's has a going fucking on. Elvis accent and he dresses in Elvis clothes, so we can uh, we can. You know what? Uh, we can. Uh, Val Kilmer uh, and uh, Elvis Presley had in common. Val Kilmer didn't write any of his own dialogue in this movie, just like Elvis Presley didn't write any of his own songs. I was ever. about to say they both like gained fifty pounds. Later on, peanut butter sandwiches turned into a fucking pumpkin. But uh, yeah. Val Kilmer still alive and kicking the by his bullshit, and he seems to be in in good spirits. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him in Top Gun Two. Maverick, Top Gun Maverick, I think it's technically called, yeah, but technically. I don't give a fuck. So that's True Romance. If you haven't seen it. Stop this podcast, go watch it immediately, and return once you've watched it so you can appreciate everything we just told you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to the... This is Top 5. This is Top 5? This is Top 5. This is Top 5. So, Nicolips, did you uh, did you get the memo for the Top 5 tonight? Yeah, um, I meant to, well, I would have done, uh, if I'd done it ahead of time, I would have done this romantic comedy. Just yeah, mine's basically romantic mo- movies. Mine's more romantic comedies, really. Alex said romantic movies, so it's going to so be I kind of a So I cobbled mine together. Yeah, I cobbled mine together real quick, so. All right, what's your number five? Hold on, let me, I'm on the phone, and it's on my phone, so let me look. Oh, my quick. God. Mm. Let me refresh my memory. You need to get yourself a tablet. Really or a Today, Junior. I didn't order them, so I'll just I'll just do a random order here, oh, and God. I'll start with go- the film Ghost, Ooh, <laughs> starring Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, and Luffy <laughs> Goldberg. All right, I want to know though: is this like an ironic list, or do you genuinely like that movie as a romantic movie? And I'm just curious. I'm not making fun of you because you will. The same a question well, would apply I mean, to my list. Well, I mean, I lived with my mom and my sister growing up, and of course, so they watched that movie all the time. But they watched Dirty Dancing all the time, and I don't care about that movie or put it on my list. But gotcha. yeah, I like the the ghost the ghost aspect and all that. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. It's Ghostbusters yeah. adjacent there's enough. Not, there's nothing for you. wrong with it. There's <laughs> nothing can, wrong with it. I can understand that. That's you fine. describe too many things as Ghostbusters adjacent. You're very liberal with it. Who me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, it's just a movie about ghosts and shit. And it's around the same, you know, not super, like, <laughs> just removed from the time frame. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about little Nick there dressed up as a Ghostbuster watching this movie with his mom and sister trying to get into it because it's better than Dirty Dancing. I like it. Yeah, I, I liked that. Whoopi Goldberg as a kid, and I liked, you know, ghost stuff. And I thought it was, I mean, especially, like, uh, those weird, like, demons that come out of the shadows and drag people off the hill. I mean, that's kind of cool. Oh, yeah, it's kind of spooky for sure. It, uh, yeah, I got It's interesting. Spooky. It's interesting. I think it's a good movie. I'll give it to not, you. Not ironically, no. Okay, yeah. okay. Fair enough. Uh, it, it especially, like, I'm not that big into romantic movies in general, so, you know. You can't see these, list. can you? <laughs> What's your number five, Alec? My number five is from the year 2000. In the year 2000! Uh, the movie High Fidelity, starring John Cusack. What a nice. Um... Yeah, I just really like that movie. I think it qualifies as a romantic comedy because it's pretty funny. Um, but it's also a little darker. It has a, like a less of a happy message, but it also is kind of a happy ending anyway. So, Like a Robert Kraft at a Florida massage parlor happy ending or just like happy and joyful at the end? Joyful. No, oh, not okay. a hand job. Not a, not, okay, a, okay. not a hot oiled hand job. Okay, I had to check. I just had a no. Not, not, a, not a hot oiled hand job. Not a hot oiled job performed by hand. Yeah. Uh, my number five is the 2012 film starring Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper, Silver Linings Playbook. I really enjoy that because wah, 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 wah. these two have a pretty good performance each of being people dealing with like mental illness and other stuff and like 
they play it sincere so they're not like making you fucking hate people with mental illness which you know a lot of movies in the 80s and early 90s like made you really fucking despise like sick people to some degree and I you know this movie I think captures a portrayal pretty well of, of those people and uh, it's interesting I, it's fun I thought because it was something I had seen recently but then I was like I really don't remember details of it huh but I remember I remember liking it so I thought about putting that on my list. So I'm trying to like put movies that I've seen enough to remember or seen recently. Yeah, I didn't go too deep for my list. Um, what's your uh, number four, Nick? Uh, again, this is not in a particular order, but Chasing Amy. Makes sense. Yeah, that's a good one. I can agree with that one. I'd say it's the most romantic out of the Kevin Smith films. What about Jersey Girl? More, more focused on. Well, yeah, I'm mean, out of the, the Jay and Silent Bob. But Jason Amy is a much better film than Jersey Girl. I know. I was just being a dickhead. Yeah. Well, I only saw Jersey Girl once, and it was a long time ago. But I'm sure it's better. Yeah. That's quite all right. Okay, Alec, number four. I can't remember. Number four, from 2012. Django Unchained. Okay. Maybe a little bit fucked up of an answer, but it's also. Like, that love yeah, story in there is insane. You like it, huh? Yes. I fucking want to cry when I watch some of that shit. The close-ups on, like, Jamie Foxx's eyes when he's seeing what's being done to his wife and shit, it fucking breaks my heart to think about. And that movie's just gut wrenching anyway. But it's also a Tarantino movie, so it's like, it's, it's, it's a fucking emotional roller coaster, that movie, so. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And that's why Alex List is not romantic comedies, but romantic films in general. There's yeah. an underlying love story there that obviously drives the characters. I mean, that is the whole thing of the movie is that plot, that love yeah. story. So so my number four is The Princess Bride from 1987. It's on my honorable mentions. It's a classic one. Yeah. It's one of those I didn't watch a lot growing up. You know, I'd probably seen it a time or two or parts of it, but... Anybody want a peanut? I really appreciate that movie now for what it is, so I, I enjoy it. So number three, Nicholas. I put Forever Young by Mel Gibson. Forever Young. I want to be forever young. All right. It's kind of a similar thing as Ghost. I watched it a lot as a kid because that was what was on the TV. Okay. Fair enough. But, it, you know, it's got some sci-fi stuff to it, you know, with the cards in it freezing and then starts rapidly aging for some reason. That's fair. Mm-hmm. What's your, uh... Oh, I was going to cut you off, Nick. I didn't know if you are done or not. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. All right, uh, Alec, number three. Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Uh, that's good. Another, uh, one that is, ac- it's like a, it's a genuinely a comedy, but it's also like it, there's a few moments where you're, you are a little fucking actually really depressed watching that movie, especially if it's at all relatable to you, so... That movie's real as fuck. Like, Jason Siegel wrote that movie and starred in it, and he wrote it based on, like, shit that really happened to him. So, <laughs> it's pretty funny, actually, just thinking about that. And then it was, uh, you know, Judd Apatow was one of those people who produced it, and he helped him learn how to write in general. You know, he cast him back in the day in Freaks and Geeks and stuff and threw other shit about for uh, for a long time. But, yeah, that's uh, that's a good one. Excellent. Uh, my number three is. I thought of that. I probably would have put it on there. Uh, the 1989 film "Say Anything." I think that's a classic, even though there's a little bit of cringe-worthy stalkerish moments, like the uh, like just obsessed. But they the, it's they downplay it so much that it's lighthearted enough. You're like, okay, I can get behind that. It's fun. John Cusack's great in that. How I Met Your Mother has a whole thing about that called the Dobler Dahmer effect, and it's all about how um, whether or not a gesture towards a woman is creepy or not. Or I mean, towards anyone, it is up to how they how they experience re- it. Ex- yeah, how they react to it, basically. Yeah, that's all. Because if any experience. other woman, you know, you went on to their lawn and hold up a stereo, they might think you're a fucking insane. Yeah. But yeah. Well, and the context of this is different because it's in the '80s, right? You had like a phone or anything else. Like nowadays, people would be Snapchatting or TikToking or whatever else, like trying to get someone's attention, right? So. 
all that shit just happens in different ways than it does in this movie now. So it's really about the context and the timing you're living in. So I yeah. mean, it's very in the moment there. I feel like that's something that like teenagers really would do to each other. Healthy or not. Yeah, I get that. Uh, number two. Number two. Is it me? That's yes. you. I put the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix and um, Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. You guys seen it? No, it's on my list, though. I have not seen that, actually, but uh, I've heard good things about it. But I uh, we might have to check that out. Yeah, at some point, for sure. Yeah. A film exposure might basically be in our future. Falls, falls in love with a computer program. Oh, so it's basically like uh, Blade Runner 2049? Yeah. So <laughs> that's, you knew exactly where I was going with that. Yeah. No, but this actually came out before that, so. I know. Yeah, I think it was 2013, I want to say. Something like that, I think. Yeah, you're right. Well, my number two, coming out of nowhere, this film is about a divorced couple that gets back together. Ooh, what's this? Well, there's a, a, a very s interesting series of events in this film through uh, a natural liar. disaster. Um, oh, Twister. You <laughs> it is Twister. A oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Twister. You, once you said natural, I was like, oh, God damn it. How did I, how did I miss that? That is yeah. true. Like, did you sign the papers? Uh, no. Twister is, it is a romantic movie. That's what it is. <laughs> no matter how you look at it. Like, the character plot is about those people falling in love with, again, basically, like, re, you know what I mean. They decide they still love each other, basically, and he's like, all right, get over your shit, let's get back together. And then the other woman, uh, you know, from Jamie Gertz from Lost Boys, is like, all right, I'm going to go talk to people about their penises. Yeah. No, that's actually a great, great point, because that movie is very much about two people falling in love again. And, like, did they ever really completely fall out of love, or did they just not work on their problems anymore like right when you you meet them and they have the natural chemistry and then they start working together like right that movie wouldn't be it what it is without that story no without those and just like somebody else coming along or them just getting along the whole time and yeah like if that's it was a just the tornado element. scientist plot you wouldn't give as much of a fuck no that's so. a very good call i like that that's a good call out it's a great choice your number two uh can't hardly wait from 1998 it's kind of one of those cheesy coming at age stories but i saw that like when it came out in theaters and like it's just one of those the ones that has stuck with me not because it's great just because it's like nostalgic for me hmm. so i enjoy watching yeah, that I occasionally. Watched it a lot i watched it a lot when it came about the time i was on dvd and playing on the yeah that was cable. that was one of the earlier dvds i bought you know and i was like oh, okay that's kind of fun so that's just more nostalgic though than anything else like when you watch it now it's not amazing but it's not it's not terrible. It's pretty much just a 90s okay. rom-com thing, so. Thank you. Uh, what's your number thought, one, Nick? I thought it was a, I thought that was a little newer than that. I thought that was like 2001 or something. Nah, it's uh, 1998. Yeah. Hmm. What's, the, what's that girl's name? Yeah, that the, girl. The, the star of the main girl in that movie. Don't ask me. I've oh, never seen fuck it. Fuck me. Oh, Jennifer Love Hewitt. Yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer Love, Love Hewitt, Hewitt right? yeah. Yeah, I was thinking I was like 2000, 2001. Okay. Well, I kind of blanked on my fifth choice, so I put something I, put, I watched recently, which is A Star is Born. I thought it was pretty good. The with, remake uh, or the Bradley original? Cooper. Oh, the remake. I don't okay. think I've ever seen the original. Yeah, I watched okay. the remake recently. So. I've not Bradley seen that. Cooper, <laughs> I'm uh, good on that one. Don't even. Lady Gaga. Did you watch that? Yeah, let the, people uh, who want to watch it watch it, but I'm good. good. Can I ask you a serious question it's real better, quick? It's yeah. better than you would have think, yeah. Did you, did you watch that with a romantic partner or interest? Yeah, I watched it with a girl. Yeah. I said romantic partner interest. I don't know what you're into. And it's not like we would judge you for it. We don't give a shit. Yeah. Whatever turns you on, turns you on. By, I know. I'm just asking you. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. But I, I was, I was kind of curious to watch it anyway, because I, I like Bradley Cooper, so I'm not a Lady Gaga fan per se, but I thought she did a good job. So, so you're telling me you haven't tried her Oreos yet? <laughs> Does it take <laughs> No, I haven't. Is it just different colors, or does it taste different? I have no idea. Um, I've seen them. I just haven't purchased them. No interest yeah. in that. Too much food coloring. It's a wild package. Yeah. All right, Alec, what's your number one? Number one 
which I believe has actually been my number one before on other lists. Oh, shit. For it's... good reason. Returning for the win again, 2004's Shaun of the Dead. That's right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the most legendary Zomcom of them all. Uh, this movie, again, opens up with Sean breaking up with his girlfriend. In the end, they are back together. They are the story. Zombies are the setting. Boom! Hmm. Okay. Well, that's fine. Yeah. My number one is uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Oh, I My respect that. Mine's all romantic comedies here. I didn't do any other stuff just because there's too many funny ones that I really enjoy. Well, here's the thing, yeah. And I like this one, man, because it's fucking hilarious, but it's so serious at some times, yeah. too. Like you said, all the stuff that Alex said, I was like, yes, that's why that's my number one. Uh-huh, I agree with what you did. I like what you've done here. Mm -hmm. Be sure to dot the lowercase j's and uh, appreciate that this movie, not only is the music part of it great, um, Russell Brandt is great in there, too, is like the kind of bumbling uh -huh. idiot. Um, do like a rock opera with Justin always gets celebrities' names like one letter fucking wrong. <laughs> it's hilarious to what me. What did I say? Uh, Russell Brandt. Uh, what is it? Brand. Oh, that's right. Yeah, whatever. I got. <laughs> no, it's just funny to me because it's like always slightly off. Like it's a like a like it's your fucking aunt who just doesn't know what she's talking about. You know that's what I mean? Fucking amazing. I'm the like asshole. oh yeah, Ghostbusters with Bill Murphy. Yeah, Goatbusters with William Murphy. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna start calling him Bill Murphy. <laughs> if I ever meet him, I should do that. You should. Ju we should just refer to him as that in Ghostbusters groups and like yeah. Ghostbusters videos. Bill Murphy and uh, yeah, Daniel <laughs> Aykroyd. Uh, no. So my my honorable mentions here include uh, a lot of romantic films, uh, such as True Romance and The Wedding Singer, which I didn't include because we're talking about those this week. I didn't need to talk yeah. about them more. Um, Bride of Chucky. Which is fucked up, but still a romantic movie. Yes. Uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Uh, just kind of depressing. Yes, very the, depressing, but still The Graduate. Just like romance, though. Yeah. Meet the Parents, mm. Mall Rats, Titanic, Drive, and uh, Brokeback Mountain. Yeah, I thought Titanic would be kind of obvious. Well, yeah, that's why I didn't put it on there. It's not it's, really something I go back and watch too often, either. I Probably do, it but it's only because it's like I like the historical disaster aspect yeah, of it a lot too. So, such a long. I watched movie. that again recently and had a whole new like respect for it because it's just been so long since I've seen it. And plus, you know, the first twenty minutes of that movie is Bill Paxton, so it's like, come on, give me some uh, Bill Paxton in a submarine action. That's true. I have not seen that movie probably since I was a child. So, oh, it's worth going back. We'll have okay. to cover that at some point. That'll probably have to get its own. Uh, full episode because it's so long it's two vhs tapes when did that actually sink 1912 yeah but what month april oh we'll watch april. it in april then oh shit you know this was actually like six days before your birthday that it sank that's another fucking disaster oh, yeah so there's this ongoing joke and it's not really a joke because it's <laughs> fucking super depressing but all the bad shit that happens around my birthday I, I, did I say bad shit that happens around my birthday? I didn't even... <laughs> bad shit that happens around my birthday. I'm, I don't know what the fuck's wrong with me tonight. Oh, yeah. So my birthday is April 20th. Not only did Columbine happen on that day, but Hitler was born on that day. So I got two things going against me on that. The day before that was the Oklahoma City bombing. Two days before that was the Virginia Tech shooting. And the six days before that was the Titanic sinking. Yeah, so... Um, Lots of bad news around uh, my holiday. birthday month. Yeah, but it is also my favorite holiday. You'd think that'd be my birthday. It's kind of <laughs> bullshit, actually. <laughs> kind of pisses me oh, off that that's his birthday and not mine. Well, I think a lot of people... Well, that's probably why it is 420, because people want to forget all the bad shit that happened around that day. Yeah, that's my theory, too. If my theory <laughs> well, is Well, then correct, maybe my theory is correct. I have a strong psychic belief. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's that's romantic movies and, and all that jazz for you. What else we got to talk about? We got... The Wedding Another Singer. film to talk about. You know what I just watched? Me pulling a can off some moron's fist. Return of the Jedi. Did you see Alien? When that uh, creature was in that guy's stomach? <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god. You ever seen that really old movie? Uh, Empire Strikes Back? Jesus, Tony. Welcome to Retro Release Reviews. Oh, um, oh, I don't really have it. Again, same joke. Oh, yeah. That's uh, twice. Yes. I want some butt, and I want it now. 
<sighs> That's a Top Gun reference for you kids in the audience. Uh, the Wedding Singer, man. I fucking love this movie. It's a classic. Yes. It's probably my third favorite Adam Sandler movie overall, I would say. Hmm. That's interesting. Behind. Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, and this? Yeah, I'd say those are my top three. Punch Drunk Love might be my third. I don't know. Yeah, that's... I've only seen that once, and that was right when it came out, so I need to watch that again. That's good as well, man, but The Wedding Singer is just... It was way ahead of its time, because like they did the whole like 80s throwback thing in the mid-90s, and it works so well there. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun, and... You just feel like that's like their coming age story for some of the people that were in that. They experienced that stuff, so um, yeah. it works. There's um there's a lot of interesting backstory to this movie. Oh, enlighten us, dear. Um, I didn't even look up who the fucking actual credited screenwriters are of this movie. Do you know who they are? Negative ghostwriter. I believe Adam Sandler's one of them that's actually credited. Um, as far as uncredited goes, Judd Apatow did some rewrites on this. You know who did the most rewrites on this? Uh, Carrie Fisher. Really? About six months of work. That's bad. From Carrie Fisher went into this movie. You know, she was famously a ghostwriter that, you know, started coming out in the mid 2000s or the 2010s or whatever, that she had done a lot of work like that. Um, And she did work on this. Um, Apparently, she wanted to make the women characters smarter, and that's why Drew Barry's character works so well. Yeah, just, fascinating. It's a, it's a great story too, right? And uh, um, I did see a a snippet about Adam Sandler saying like positive stuff about this. Or I should say Adam Sandler, as you'd want to say his name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Adam uh, Snadler. <laughs> Sandler. The sand is for the poor people. I hate That's sand. Not it gets everywhere. <laughs> um. Oh, you don't have that sound clip. No, not yet, but we will. <laughs> We got one from Anakin, though. Yeah. Um, but that he liked this movie because it was about people falling in love, and you know, there's so many people that give up or get hurt that they like have a shitty outlook on on love, and like his view through this, like despite going through bullshit, like still finds the love story for him. So yeah, it's great. I mean, some of my favorite stuff is even just the fucking '80s reference stuff in there. Like they don't get too heavy with it all the time. But, like, the stuff they add in there that you really pay attention to is, like, the Freddy Krueger mask and glove, and he shows the picture of... Well, here's the thing. I think this movie does do that stuff a little over the top, but that's because that what's... It's it's one of those pop culture things, like, the 80s stuff that looks crazy looks like Wedding Singer. The 80s stuff that's more authentic looks like Stranger Things. Like yeah. season one of Stranger Things, how it looks authentic, like there's wood paneling and shit like that. And there, there's none of that in this. There's like a little bit of that maybe in the basement, but I don't recall it being wood panel or anything like that. Uh, it's, but it's, they definitely have like Rubik's Cubes, and the guy's wearing a fucking thriller jacket. I mean, it's a little over the fucking top <laughs> for sure. There's a goddamn DeLorean, the Freddy Krueger mask. They're a little, little over the top. And the 80s songs are like the fucking probably top 10 hits of the 80s. So I, I guess I disagree with you on that statement as all. Well. <laughs> oh, well, that's fine. I just mean that there's not... The ones that they have in there, they don't make it a point to talk about them over and over and over again. Now, like, the it one outfit... More, you know, like, the Michael Jackson jacket is crazy, but um, what's that character's name? His friend? The limo driver? Oh, I can't remember. Alan Covert's the actor. Yeah, anyway, so when he comes to pick him up at one point in time, like, he's got, like, those ugly-ass jeans on. He's got the belt. It looks like something her dad fucking wore in the 80s. Like, I could find that fucking outfit if I go back and look through photos of that. So there's some stuff that's very authentic, and there's some stuff that's way off. Yeah. Uh, But, I mean, like, even just, like, kind of in the moment, like, the hairstyles and shit, yeah, you know, they do the biggest stuff. But you're a a wedding singer guy, like, so you're obviously entertaining people, right? So I think that plays well for the way the stuff they do go over the top with. Yeah. At one point, he tells her... uh when she stayed back over at his house, Linda, she's wearing his uh, Van Halen shirt. Yeah. And he's like, take that shirt off or the band will break up. And that's like the, well, he, the, the year after this movie takes place is when uh, David Lee Roth left Van Halen or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that's clearly tongue in cheek, right? So that, to me, like that one's okay just because it's silly but stupid. Yeah. But that's just a fun movie overall, man. I, I really enjoy it. So it's silly. It's easy to watch. Like it's as serious as it is. 
Like you, like they do a good job of making you hate Glenn, even though he doesn't have a lot of screen time. The screen time he has, he's just like dismissive of of his lady, and he's just an asshole. And then he's like, "Oh yeah, I could get younger women than that." Yeah. So, and then they go to like the whole oh. thing that like everyone, every man that's ever had a romantic interest in his life deals with at some point in time, unless you're a fucking trust fund kid or something. Um, you know, like being that financially stable person that you know makes that wop but does it but does it this movie shows you that it doesn't have to there can be more than that um that's interesting so alexis arquette yes. plays george in this which is uh basically a play on fucking boy george and uh george happens to be obsessed with boy george um alexis arquette also is in the movie Pulp Fiction as the second gunman on La Grassy Knoll. Uh, no, the the gunman in the bathroom from the end of the movie. Um, as well as, uh, what is the other thing I've written down? Oh, yes, Damon, Damien from uh, Bride of Chucky. Yep. So uh, Damien's the person that the uh, fucking Tiffany is sort of dating, I guess, you know? It's yeah, implied. it's her boyfriend that she winds up sacrificing to Yeah. Chucky. A very fascinating scene. One of the most hilarious scenes in that movie just because, you know, come on. But, uh, so that's our other Arquette for the movie. Yep. So what's your favorite part about this movie, Nick? What do you like about mm. it? Or do you not like it? <laughs> Is that a Wilhelm scream? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of course probably, it is. Of course probably it is. One of, probably one of the scenes where he's actually performing at a wedding, maybe the first one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like he's in the moment. Like it seems like really authentic. He's having fun. Yeah, and he's helping. I remember that bar mitzvah was pretty good. And he's helping that little kid get a dance and stuff. Um, Steve Buscemi in that movie. Oh, my God, yes. That's wow, Alec and I were go. watching this go. the other day. Yeah, and that's, and that's still go. the that's first wedding. Part. <laughs> yeah. He's like, best man, the better man. <laughs> and then he fucking clinks his drink on the cymbal, and I was like, oh, that had to be improv. I guarantee you fucking turn around and just did that in the moment. Because yeah. that's what that looks like and feels like. Oh, it's fucking so good. No, that's a classic, though, there. I think that works really well. And, uh, I, I, yeah, John Lovitz is just nice to see for his quick, short appearance, too. Yeah, John Lovitz, too. Mm, I'm Lovitz. reaping all the rewards, or all the benefits, whatever the fuck he says. He's benefits. losing his mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, what did you uh? What do you like the most about this, or hate the most? Uh, I the if anything, like I said, I just don't. It's a little over the top on its '80s portrayal, but I don't blame it because it is like 1998. So it's like literally eight years away from the '80s. They're remembering the big, the big fucking shit. They're basically this is MTV the movie almost. You know what I mean? It hadn't been overdone at this point either. Yeah, it wasn't overblown it was like 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 i said i feel like this is a very portrayal of like what it would be like if you watched mtv and shit in the 80s like this is what you'd think the 80s is that's um, fair i can respect and to be that. fair i'm born in 91 i'm just saying you know that's what a- aliens would think the 80s were just by watching mtv signal you know yeah so one thing i noticed when i watched this the other day was that I never noticed before. So the song that Adam Sandler writes, you know, and plays on the end on the acoustic guitar says, Grow Old With Me. Uh, the scene where Julia and Robbie kiss when they're doing, like, the demo kiss for, like, how are they going to kiss at the wedding? Like, not porno tongue or whatever. Mm-hmm. In the background, when they kiss, they play, like, an orchestral version of Grow Old With Me there in the background. Just, like, a couple of, like, you know, just, like, one little bar through the music there. And you're like, oh, mm-hmm. okay, that makes sense. Kind of a little foreshadowing there I never noticed before. Yeah, that makes sense. thought it was a neat, neat little touch. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Billy Idol's hilarious in this, too, because he's, like, so over the top. <laughs> and if you've seen him do other shit, like, if you've ever seen him on the Bam or Jarrah show or whatever, like, that's that's Billy Idol for you. Yeah, Billy Idol's, um, he's a fucking character for sure. Yeah, 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 I'm Billy Idol. And we're in first class, and they allow us to do pretty much whatever we want. Would you like for me to take your pants off instead? <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. I also really like when his friends tell him, you know, and he's like, 
I just want somebody to hold me and tell me that everything is going to be all right. Yeah. Like, I feel that shit. <laughs> There's that cheesy little moment, too, like where he goes to check on Robbie down in the bed there, and he lays down by him, and he's like, oh, man, these sheets are really soft and smell great or something. And he, like, does basically the advertising for the yeah the bed sheets, and he's like, now be quiet or now leave me alone. Yeah. Like, right at the end of that, I thought that was really funny. I don't know why that's so funny, but it's just kind of one of those things, like, yeah, someone would, like, know something so silly like that and still be like, Fucking, like, in a funk. Yeah. No, it's very, uh, I like that scene a lot, too. It's fucking hilarious. Absolutely. Is that about all we got for Wedding Singer? That's pretty much it. Overall, it's, uh... Pretty good! It's pretty, 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 pretty good. So, uh, I guess we'll move on to our last segment of the day. Ooh, yeah. Covering some... Extreme Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. We now return to the real Ghostbusters. Diane, 11.30 a.m., February 24th. Entering the town of Twin Peaks. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Bill Murray is the funniest man on the planet. Look at all the wrinkles in my face. Episode 23 of Extreme Ghostbusters, titled Slimer's Sacrifice. Yeah. It's actually a pretty fun episode. Uh, we kind of skimmed through this one and watched it while we're getting everything set up tonight. And uh, Alec had like an epiphany at the end. He's like, oh man, this is this episode. And like he just spouted off everything that happened. It was like, yes, yes it is. I'm glad you know it. Yeah. Um... He was slightly distracted. We almost had a USB uh, hub almost catch fire on us. Uh, uh, that was fun. Yeah, I was having computer issues. Uh, uh, uh. You didn't say the magic word. Um, uh, uh, uh. But we sorted it out, so we're all good. Yeah. So, obviously, you got to set up some tension on this episode. So, Eddie's getting all pissed off at Slimer for being a Slimer, and you know, hurts his feeling, and Slimer all feels bad and has a guilty conscience, which is weird for something that's dead. But that's how the story goes. You know that? I'm really sick. That sounds like shit, that quote. Yeah, you need to get a fucking better version of that because that was disappointing. (laughs) What was that? It's not true. No, it was uh, Joe Pesci from Home Alone saying, you're sick. You know that? You're sick. I thought it was Joe Pesci, but I didn't know what was being said. <laughs> <sighs> I'm getting trigger happy. Yeah, he's he's over here distracted. So, but one I also of my didn't favorite see the first half of this episode. So go ahead. Okay, so basically the Ghostbusters are fighting Fenris, which is like a dog ghost, kind of has some terror dogish vibes to it, but looks more like a wolf, a wolf, a wolf man. Yeah. Um, and so Cert is his demon, and they're trying to bring out. Ragnarok, so like they're trying to get him freed from the containment unit and all this other shit going on. It's a pretty well written episode. It's fun. Um, some of my favorite stuff is that they're in the containment unit again, right? And Egon's talking about having been in there before. You know, it was a real Ghostbusters mm-hmm. thing. So I like how they reference that. Like, if you forget that this is a sequel series, it truly is. Mm-hmm. Some people forget that at times. Yeah, I like being reminded of that. I like when they reference stuff from real Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, other, just in general. So. Yeah, so, you know, they've, they've got that reference going on there. They kind of build a backstory there. Oh, there it goes again. Gee, Scoob! Man. Gee, Scoob! Let's get back to the mystery van. <laughs> so, Slimer, you know, being all butthurt and upset about Eduardo telling him he's basically a worthless piece of shit, sacrifices himself and uh, does a good one for the Ghostbusters team. Yeah. Goes in the containment unit. Gets in there, and then obviously they realize they got to go get him out and deal with this whole situation. And uh, it's pretty fun. Some of my favorite stuff are the outfits that Egon and Eduardo wear when they go in the containment unit. The uh, real Ghostbusters looking costumes they have. Definitely. Especially with the dome heads, like very Mr. Uh, Mr. Freeze, Batman the Animated Series ish stuff. But like these character designs almost look like they're ripped directly off the real Ghostbusters toy line, which. It's fun Didn't to they have see a that crossover figure like that with like a dome helmet or something. Yeah, there's, 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 there's one or two at least. Yeah, I think there's a few that are yeah. very similar to that. So that's why it really has those vibes, which works. Yeah, it's nice to see that stuff referenced in there instead of just it blindly being toy company stuff doing their own thing. But uh-huh. that actually is one of the things that's great about that 
line though is that it's so different from what the series was that they you know instead of having toys influence a cartoon the cartoon influenced the toys to do their own thing so yeah I like how they call back some other ghosts in this like the sirens are in there that we'd seen in an earlier episode so they make references to the series itself that they're in the containment unit there's a lot of fun stuff like that and it works and then angry evil Slimer is one of the best parts in this because you can't do a lot with like that Slimer design to make him look angry, so it's mostly just facial expression and like the way he's portraying his lower front teeth mm-hmm. and his eyes. But it works really well. Like you kind of believe what's going on there. So yeah, yeah, I definitely like uh, Eduardo and Slimer's interactions and their sort of back and forth existence. It's it's you know it's very reminiscent of Peter and Slimer basically. But yeah, it's that love hate. There's like that. You know, and that's all very real Ghostbusters issue. I like how they carried that kind of storyline over of, of having that companionship, right? It's yeah. like the it's almost like one of those buddy cop movies like uh Canine was it Canine Cop? The one with Jim Belushi? Jesus Christ. It's kinda got those vibes because he's <laughs> like he's reluctantly or Turner and Hooch I think like it was re- called it was called Ren Ten Ten Canine Cop, I think. Yeah. But either way, or Turner and Hooch, like, where they reluctantly, like, get this partner, but then they, like, have this respect and, you know, obviously work well together. That's kind of the vibes that gives. What you've just said is one of the most <laughs> insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. <laughs> I just I just don't like the movie Canine. Uh, okay, well, that's fine. I just meant, like, the vibes <laughs> of, like, the reluctantly taking on something that's fucking up your life, and then you realize, like, oh, well, it's actually not fucking up my life. It's bringing enlightenment and joy to my life. Oh, yeah, like most films from 1987 through 1994. <sighs> yeah, specifically. That's a, like, the a big thing there. Specifically the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. I really get that in those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or dogma. Yep. I don't want to do the thing, but you got to do the thing. Fine, I'll do the thing. Lord of the Rings, for example. <laughs> I've been rewatching Lord of the Rings, and every time Justin's just like, I can tell he's just, there's like this level of just hate that makes us piss boil when he sees it on the TV. <laughs> it's not even that. I've just never actually watched those. <laughs> so, um, Extreme Ghostbusters, though. If you're uh, wanting to watch along, it's on Hulu, so check it out. And then it's also on YouTube. Do it. So check these out and watch. Well, one episode is on YouTube right now. Well, they're releasing them weekly, you dingleberry. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, but it'll be like a year before. It'll be less than a year. Whatever. There's not As long as they're episodes. consistent, it'll be less than a year. So, you know. There's a few interesting things near the end of this episode, though. Like, uh, Slimer flies Eduardo around a few times in the ghost world of the containment unit. And then at the end where he places his entire body in his mouth to prevent him from being um, attacked from a fireball sent by Cert. Be and cool then, to he, have a, go th- ahead. then he barfs him up when he comes out of the containment unit, which is kind of neat. I was about to say, I just really like the artwork inside the containment unit. The vibes. Very much there, like yeah. real Ghostbusters and in this one. But like, it'd be cool to have a print done up of like inside the containment unit with a whole bunch of fucking recognizable ghosts. So when Slimer, like, takes Eduardo in him, like, it reminds you, it's like another real Ghostbusters toy reference where you get the vibes of those gooper ghosts, like, you could put the whole figure in the mouth and blow the air and slime all over him, so had those vibes. So I do like how they reference some of that stuff, even though it was a different company with the toy line, but I like how you see the influence on the writing from other stuff that already existed. Yeah, yeah, I get that. (laughs) But uh, that's pretty much what I got to say about that episode. Uh, anybody else got anything noteworthy to say? Nick, uh, do you have anything to say? I don't think anything different, no. Okay. I would just like to say... Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. Alec always gets pissed when I quote this in real life, and he's always thinking I'm talking about turkey turkey basting. Losers always whine about their turkey based. That's what I always say back to them. Losers always whine about their based. <clears throat> Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. So, um, uh, remember to hit up our YouTube if you're not, because you can see us. This is a video podcast now. We've been yeah. keeping this up uh, pretty consistently. So, I would recommend you hit up our YouTube. Check out all that we're doing there. 
Um, we got new mics and uh, new soundboard. Content. Yeah. All this stuff. And the new mics, you can actually see more of her faces. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's good or what bad. Was the thing that caught on fire? Uh, Universal Serial Bus Hub. Yeah. Um, so hit up our Instagram, our Twitter, our Twitter, our TikTok, our all fans. of those things. Um, at bros underscore frog for Twitter at frog bros podcast pretty much everywhere else frog bros podcast dot com youtube dot com slash the frog bros um, thank you for listening these are my dinner guests the frog brothers frog brothers frog brothers these are my dinner guests frog brothers frog brothers frog brothers these are my dinner guests the frog brothers frog brothers frog brothers these are my dinner guests, Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. These are my dinner guests, the Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers, Frog Brothers. Shut this off. Shut these all off.